In this video, I'm going to be building the 172nd scale Fokker E5 from Armour Hobby. I built this kit once before, before I started my channel. And because it was such a fun build, I wanted to try it again. If you head way back in time on my Instagram feed, you can find pics of the original build. And that old build did turn out really nicely. Apart from the wonky top wing. Well, can I do better this time? Let's find out. I'm James and you're watching LPJ Models. This tiny 172nd scale Fokker turns up on just one sprue. The detail is really nice and there are some really fine parts. I did notice however that the mould must be getting a little tired as there is a fair amount of flash on the small parts. That doesn't detract however from the really nice detail. On the few fabric parts there is a nice representation of ribbing and sagging and on the plywood wing there are some really nice panel lines. This kit doesn't just stop at plastic parts, there is a small sprue of photo etch to go with it. There's also a nice sheet of cartograph decals for the markings. There is also a second decal sheet made by Techmod. This contains some nice wood grain and all the lozenge you'd need. Because these are printed however, instead of being screen printed, you can see a slightly dotty pattern. Hopefully this won't show up too much. The instructions are fairly straightforward and easy to follow. Being a small kit, there is only a few pages dedicated to the build, with the rest being full colour profiles for the markings. And now that you've seen everything in the box, we should probably get on with the build. As per usual, I use my god hand single edge sprue cutters to remove all the parts from the sprues. These give a really nice clean cut, which leaves you with minimal cleanup. That being said, any sprue nubs that were left over were cleaned up with either a scalpel or a sanding stick. Here's some of that flash I mentioned earlier. It's not the end of the world, but it is a tad annoying considering the kit is fairly new. I just checked scale mates and it was originally tooled in 2017. So as of this video, it is seven year old tooling. Man, time goes fast. There were a few ejector pin marks on the interior that needed to be filled. These were filled with some sprue goo. Now sprue goo is a mix of styrene and styrene cement. The styrene pieces are melted down with the glue to create a filler that has similar sanding properties to the original plastic. It makes filling a breeze. The only downside is it can take up to 24 hours or more to dry. But once it's fully dry, it sands just like plastic. Which is also quite useful because you'll also be able to scribe it and re-add details as if it was normal plastic. The interior was given a layer of MRP clear dope linen. Because this is going underneath decals, the colour doesn't matter so much as long as it's light. To make sure these interior decals stick down nicely, I'm using VMS Decal Set and Fix. After the interior decals were soaked for a few seconds, they were slid carefully into place. Because of the curve on the part and the delicacy of the decals, this did take a few seconds to get right. But after some fiddling and faffing, I did get there in the end. Now and again, to make sure the decals were in the correct position, I had to float some water underneath them just to make them easier to reposition. This can be a great technique if you've got a decal with a large surface area, because sometimes they just want to stick down at the wrong time. All the excess bubbles were then pushed out with a cotton bud. There were several more interior decals, but I'm not going to send you to sleep and show you all of them, so we'll move on. The next step was to populate some of those interior parts with the photo etched additions. These were glued in place with VMS super glues. Next up, I glued the photo etched seat belts into place. I did make a small cushion out of green stuff putty, but it was really fiddly, so I didn't get around to filming it. Once the seat was done, the build continued on with added photo etched parts to the combing. These were glued straight on top of the plastic details. With most of the detail done, it was time to do some more painting. For the green sidewalls, I used MRP 110 RAF Dark Green. Strangely, I don't seem to have many olive greens in at the moment, so this is the one I used. When working on the control column, I lost one of the parts, so I had to scratch build a new one. Again, this was tiny, so it was really hard for me to show you how I did it. 
but it was effectively just bending some wire into shape and using super glue to replicate the wooden handles. This was painted in black and the handles were picked out in Vallejo's old wood. With some of the details painted, it was time to start bringing the cockpit together. I must have drunk too much coffee because for some reason my hands are really shaky here. To add some visual interest that nobody's going to see, I also decided to rig the inside of the cockpit. This was done with InfiniModel's 1700 rigging wire. Each wire was glued into place with VMS super glue. Once the glue had set, the wire was stretched and then glued in place at the other end to make sure it was taut. The throttle and its bracket was painted with two types of brass colour. It was based with Citadel Rune Lord brass for opacity and then I followed over with a layer of Vallejo brass for brightness. To paint these fine details I'm using a nice sable brush, a 2-0 Artis Opus Series S. Continuing the detail work, I added some rigging to the frameworks at the side of the cockpit. I used an old airbrush needle to apply my superglue with precision. This is a great idea if you only want to put down a tiny amount. One side of the rigging wire was then put into place and then stretched across to a second dab of glue. This makes sure there's enough tension in the rigging. I say rigging, but I think these are bracing wires, but the same difference. Before I glued these in place, I needed to do a tiny amount of weathering this time in the form of an artificial shadow. I used Aptiling 502's Shadow Brown and added a line of shadow between the wood panelling and the lozenge fabric inside the cockpit. This was then blended in with a soft brush. Shading like this takes a little bit of back and forth, but with some time, patience and lots of blending, you get there in the end. The tubular sidewalls were then glued into place with superglue. These sit on two standoffs on the front firewall of the aircraft. But the fit isn't overly precise, so just be careful when you're adding it to make sure it lines up properly. The seatbelts were painted with Vallejo Field Drab. Because the base layer of MRP RAF Dark Green was a little shiny, it took a few layers for the paint to cover nicely. At this stage it looks pretty awful, but it is really zoomed in as well. At least that's my excuse. The buckles were painted in silver and the seatbelts were finished with a dark wash. The whole cockpit and fuselage assembly could then be brought together. This started with adding the rear firewall and seat to one half of the fuselage. Next up, all the mating surfaces were brushed with VMS fast setting styrene cement before popping on the other side of the fuselage and making sure it was all joined together nicely. The lower part of the fuselage was then glued into place. This fit together really nicely, although I did have to clean off a little flash before I put the pieces together. One part I forgot to film was filling in the rear seam with sprue goo and sanding it smooth, but that's what I did before I glued the combing to the front of the aircraft. Because of my overzealous sanding, I had to fit in a small shim of styrene before I fit the tailplane. But apart from that, it clicked into place perfectly. Let's move on to the engine. The engine came with some photo etch push rods. These look quite nice and were glued into place with black super glue. It took a little bit of tweaking to get them to sit in the right position, but we got there in the end. <laughs> 
This kit came with one useful feature that not a lot of other 72nd aircraft do. For the landing gear struts, a jig is supplied to make sure they dry at the right angle. Basically, you glue the struts to this plastic spacer, and when the struts are dry, you can literally trim away the spacer, leaving them theoretically in the right position. Quite a nifty feature for some really delicate parts. I also find with struts on 172nd aircraft, you really need to be on it with the gluing, making sure that A, there's enough glue, and B, the joint is positive enough for it to set with a strong bond. This can also mean being really vigilant with paint removal on parts that have already been painted. And after a few minutes, well, maybe half an hour, snip snip, and the jig was removed. All that's left to do now is some really careful cleanup on those struts. The wheels come with two options, spoked in photo etch and unspoked, which are plastic parts. Because I'm an idiot, I picked the scheme with spoked wheels. The rear sections of the wheels were fine, really easy to do because they were a flat piece of photo etch. The front, however, well, they were a lot more tricky. Because they had a slight curve, I needed to bend them carefully into shape. And because I used a lot of super glue, it's lucky I had some debonder to hand. Before I build myself up to the task of doing the front of the wheels, let's remove some of the excess super glue on the rear. To shape the front photo etch parts of the wheels, I started by using the original plastic parts as a kind of plastic former. The spoke parts were pressed carefully over the shape to try and get them in the right ballpark. They then needed loads and loads of fiddling and tweaking to get them into the right shape. And because the process was so back and forth and tedious, I didn't get a lot of it on camera. And that's probably a good thing because the process was stressful for me and watching it would probably be boring for you. Anyway, these bastard things were then glued into place with super glue. You can probably see from the footage that they're not perfect, and they're not. They did need extra fettling to make sure they looked nice enough. And that pretty much consisted of adding more super glue and sanding it away until the round sections around the spokes was fairly smooth. What the heck, let's finish off this section with an awful pun. That was wheelie tedious. Next up was more photo etch shenanigans with the cooling barrels for the machine guns. I had to form these around something round, I think I used some steel rod in the end, before they were glued into place. Sadly, again, I didn't get this on camera, but I'm sure there are videos out there of people who are much more skilled with photo etch than I am, detailing the process. Aha, paint a good bit. Using the same clear dope linen from before, I based the entire fuselage using my gallery airbrush. I then mixed up some MRP black and MRP red brown, and proceeded to add some shading in case you could see it through the decals. Spoiler alert, you couldn't. So this was a little bit of a waste of time, but it does show that this gallery airbrush can spray fairly fine lines. Another spoiler, after a few months of using gallery airbrushes, there will be a review very shortly. So keep your eyes peeled on the LPJ channel for that. The combing on the front of the fuselage was primed with black and then painted with RAF Dark Green from MRP. This was black based, but I lost the effect a little bit by applying the green too heavily. But because this was gonna be hidden by a wing, I wasn't too cut up and left it as it was. Right, it's about time to get those lozenge decals on the aircraft. To make sure they settle down, I'm using VMS Decal Set and Fix to make sure they adhere nicely to the surface. And once the decals are down, I use VMS Decal Softener to help them conform. The decals were cut out from their sheet and then dipped in warm water for a few seconds. They were then taken out and put on some kitchen towel for the excess water to wick away. After a few seconds, the adhesive had dissolved and the decal was ready to be slid onto the surface that had been prepped with VMS Decal Set and Fix. These Technod decals behaved really nicely. They also conformed to the surface really nicely with a little bit of pressure, followed by some setting solution 
Once the lozenge was done, it was time to move on to some of the markings of the aircraft. These were applied in the same way as before. Set and fix, decal, and some softener. With most of the fuselage done, it was time to turn to the wings. The first colour I'm using is MRP Pale Wood mixed with Dunkel Gelb at a ratio of around 1 to 1. Because I'm doing streaking camouflage, I want some of the plywood colour to show through. The next step, the streaking, was done in several stages. Let's start with the underside. I use these colours to mix up the purple and the pale blue. I also use these two VMS mediums. Universal Weathering Carrier was to thin the paint, and Oil Expert Enhancing Medium was to help the paint dry quicker. The oil paint was brushed onto the wings. For this first colour, I over thinned the paint. This made the technique a little bit more tricky to pull off. I approached this streaking camouflage in the same way that I would paint oil painted wood grain. Brush the colour on and then remove the excess with a stiffer brush. Because I painted the underside too wet, I had to employ an oil painting technique called tonking. This is usually done with a smooth piece of paper, but effectively you press the paper onto the surface to remove the excess oil paint. Usually it doesn't leave a pattern behind, but I was desperate to get cracking and remove some of that excess paint. At this stage, the saturation of the colours isn't ideal. They are nowhere near vibrant enough. But I know I'm going to have to do another layer after applying some decals. So hopefully double stacking the colour will increase the vibrancy. With the first layer of the underside done, it was time to move on to the top. And these are the colours I used for the upper surfaces. This was mixed with the same thinners, but less of them. The whole process was repeated in the same way, sans the tonking. And luckily, because I'm doing this with oils, I've got plenty of working time to make any corrections to any areas that I don't like. When doing oil effects like this, it's important to make sure that the paint you're using isn't too thick. It can be covered with varnish, of course, but too much varnish will eliminate any surface details. So you have to be a bit more careful. If you feel the paint is too wet at any point, you can put the part to the side for 15 minutes just for some of that excess thinner to evaporate. Once the oils had dried, I applied a layer of VMS Satin Varnish HD. This was in preparation for the next step, which was one of the decals. The first decal to go down is a German cross, but because this was a Polish aircraft, the cross was slightly repainted, with some of the cross still showing through. And on top of this, the Polish national markings were applied. Lots of layers for a simple wing. Anyway, the crosses were slid in place using the same methods and techniques I used before. Once they had settled into the details, it was time to add the next layer of oils. This is more of a suggested layer, but as I'd hoped, it did increase the vibrancy of the earlier layers. After another layer of varnish, the Polish national insignia was applied. I had to treat this with several layers of VMS decal softener. Because there were a fair few layers underneath the decal, it struggled to conform to the surfaces. So if I were to do this model again, I'd likely try and paint the markings. They just didn't turn out as nicely as I'd hoped. That being said, after a layer of matte varnish, they started to look more acceptable. Still not perfect though. Moving on to seal the decals in, I also coated the fuselage in VMS Satin Varnish. 
let's paint a few more of those details. Let's start with the engine. The engine was painted first in Mr. Color GX2 Gloss Black. It was then followed by a layer of Alclad Aluminium. The engine was then treated to a wash of Abtalung 502 engine grease, just to give it a grimy look. To add some further definition, I also added a wash of Abtalung 502 sepia. Next up, the wheels were sprayed with MRP RLM 66. The machine guns were painted with gunmetal and then glued carefully into place with super glue. I also used my favourite wood grain technique to paint the propeller. If you want to learn more about this technique, I do have a handy video on my channel. Just search for painting wood grain in oil or check out the link in the description. To add some life to the fuselage, I decided to add some grime and shading with oil paints. For this, I used Abtalung 502 Shadow Brown. This was lightly thinned before being painted onto the areas that I wanted to be dirty or shadowy. This was then blended in with a soft brush. Sometimes the oils might be slightly too wet to blend. If this is the case, set the model aside for 15 minutes for the thinner to evaporate further. Then you can blend to your heart's content. The next step was to carefully glue the landing gear assembly to the fuselage. These struts are really delicate, so you've got to be quite careful. And it's also a good idea to re-drill out the holes to make sure there's no paint on the mating surfaces. Next up, the top wing was popped into place. The holes and the top of the struts weren't a perfect fit, so I did have to do some surgery to make sure it fit properly. I found the best way of attaching the top wing was to lay the top wing flat upside down on a flat surface and then carefully lower the fuselage into place. The wheels were then fixed in place with VMS super glue. And to finish off the aircraft, the propeller was popped on. This aircraft seems a little small on its own, so let's give it a base. I picked up a small photo frame from Asda and covered it with VMS Smart Mud 2.0. This stuff has quite a nice texture and it's really light and fairly easy to work with. The only downside that I found is it takes a little bit of work to get it to stick to the surface where you want it to go. But once it's on there and dry, it has a firm bond. This stuff also holds its shape really well, so you can carve in some hills or trenches and they stay where you've put them. Which is great for me because I'm going to do a small elevated section on one corner of the diorama. This smart mud's got a fairly long working time, so there's plenty of time once you've put it down to add in some texture with an old brush. Which is exactly what I'm going to do once I've finished sculpting the base. Usually with a diorama base, I'll go to town with adding extra texture. But this time, because I wanted to keep things simple, I just used my now stippled surface as the main texture for the diorama. I always like the look of those wooden plank airfield scenes you see. So I scratch built some wooden planks out of styrene sheet and roughly sanded them to give them a nice wood grain texture. These were then glued on top of the slightly damp VMS Smart Mud with PVA glue. I then added a small fence at the rear of the diorama. These were carved from coffee stirrers and again glued in place with PVA. Off camera I threaded these with some metal wire just to complete the look of the fence. Next up was to glue on some of my favourite grass tufts by AK. I'm using 2mm summer grass tufts alongside 6mm AK wild tufts. I figured this would give a nice variation in size. Although these are supposed to be self-adhesive, I don't rate the adhesive very highly. So these are glued in place with a dollop of PVA glue and a firm press. I also added some Jarvis gravel to the gully, just to add some variety and visual interest to the rear corner of the dio. 
This was then fixed in place with VMS sand and ballast freeze. The base was then primed entirely in black. For this, I used Mr. Surfacer 1500 black. This was my last couple of milliliters of Mr. Surfacer, so I had to use it highly thinned, otherwise I wouldn't have had enough to do the job. It's also why the coverage looks pretty bad on this part, but it's good enough for priming a diorama. Next up, I used a mix of, I believe, Tamiya Dark Earth and Tamiya Red Brown. It was basically just a jar of brown paint at the bottom of my workbench that I'd mixed up for a previous project. So I don't know exactly what's in there, but that's my closest guess. The grass was given an initial layer of MRP PC10, the late version. It's quite a horrible khaki green colour, but it was a good vibe for the autumny tones that I wanted to go for. The rest of the grass will be painted later, because I got sidetracked with painting the planks. These were painted with a mixture of Vallejo wood tones. I used browns, greens, greys, khakis, flesh colours, a few yellows, some whites. So literally too many to list. But I mixed up a wide variety of colours and painted them individually on the planks. This was then followed by painting in an impression of wood grain in acrylics. So at this stage I was kind of desaturating and drying the wood out with paint as well as adding grain and details. I think acrylics work really well for weathered wood because you're not restricted with the tones that you're using in oils. Painting all these individual colours in oils would take forever, so acrylics it was. Perplexingly, I then went back to painting the grass. I sprayed the taller tufts of grass with a very light dusting of MRP's Dunkel Girl. These were going to be the autumny tufts. The smaller tufts were then sprayed with MRP's RLM 71. This was the darker base colour for the green tufts of grass. This was followed up by a light layer on the very tips of MRP zinc chromate green or yellow. Moving oddly back to the wooden part of the diorama, I added some dark wet staining with Abtelung 502 sepia. This was blended in with Universal Weathering Carrier Light. Next up, I added some AK Moss Deposits which is pretty much a green paint. I know they do a textured one, but for this scale, the green paint version was fine. I wanted to give the impression that these planks have been sitting around for a while, and this did the trick. I 3D printed some stowage for the diorama. I printed out a selection of boxes, barrels, crates, tools, all sorts. These were all primed or pre-painted with MRP dark yellow. The parts were then all given a layer of oil paints to make some wood grain. I used a mix of burnt umber, yellow ochre and sepia oils to make the wood grain. Because of the scale, I tried to make the grain really subtle, and I like to think I pulled it off. Next up, it's time to paint the figure. This tiny little pilot guy is a 172nd scale resin figure from Ares. I think the details are really nice for the scale. Anyway, he was given a layer of Mr. Surfacer 1500 Mahogany Brown, just as a primer coat. I then base coated the flesh with a mix of Vallejo Cork Brown and Hull Red. At this scale, I wasn't gonna get too fussy with shadows and highlights. I then mixed in some sunny skin tone and light flesh to add the highlights. This was first mixed in with the previous mix of cork brown and hull red before being painted on their own for the most extreme highlights. For this I'm using a Da Vinci Maestro 2-0 Kalinsky Sable. It's hard to encapsulate figure painting in a video because there's so much back and forth but hopefully you get the impression of how I got the job done. <laughs> 
the brown of the jacket, I used US Field Drab as a base color. To shade it, I added some black and a slightly warmer red brown. And for the extreme shadows, I mixed in a tiny amount of purple. The coolness of the purple helps give the illusion of depth to the shaded areas. And just like that, the shading and highlights on the jacket was done and it was time to move on to the trousers. These were painted with a mix of field blue and black Vallejo colors. Highlights added with black and white respectively. The gloves were painted in black and the highlights were added using pink. Just tiny touches into the black to bring out the sheen. For the sheepskin ruffle around his neck, I used a custom mixed tan colour, dry brushed with an off-white. And here's how he looks in the end. I'm fairly pleased with him if I say so myself. I started off with loads of barrels and crates for this diorama, but in the end I settled on just a few. I played with several compositions and they all looked way too busy. So these three items is all I ended up using. But as they say, less is more. Apart from when it comes down to leaves, that is. Yes, to add to the autumny vibe of the base, I'm going to be gluing on some leaves, individually. Tiny dabs of PVA glue were placed in the areas where I wanted the leaves to go. And then the leaves were carefully picked up and dropped into place. This was repeated ad nauseum. But the effect is really cool, and I do like these little paper leaves. I added some tiny chocks that my mate Rico recommended, great idea Rico, thank you, and popped the plane into place on the diorama. The figure was then carefully lowered into place, and the build was complete. This is one of those projects that overran a great deal. I'd planned to have it done in about a week, no dice, but I am really happy with the result. And before we get into the final gallery images proper, I'd like to say a huge thanks to my patrons for supporting my work. Your support is much appreciated. It's good to know that even though my mojo hasn't been good for a few months, maybe even a year, that I can still pop out some work that I'm proud of. And despite this being fairly small and it took too long and it's not perfect, I mean, I didn't even rig the aircraft, I'm really happy with how this came out. But let me know in the comments what you think, and what would you have done differently? And as a bit of a deviation, the final photos are actually on a white background, which is pretty inconsequential, but I wanted to try it, so let me know what you think of those. Anyway, I'm James from LPJ Models, thanks for watching. <laughs>